Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for decider matches in Group C, which means whoever loses this is eliminated from the Mythic Invitational. Whoever wins will be advancing to the top 16 to play on Saturday. Let's bring them out. From the United States of America, the third place player at Ixalan Pro Tour in 2017, it's John Rolfe. John Rolfe will be rocking out Gruel Warriors and Esper Control. John Rolfe's opponent, a man who's made quite the run in the lower bracket, the notable Finnish streamer, it's Savic. Savic is running one of our most popular pairings in the standard format today. It's gonna be Mono White versus Esper Control. Once again, whoever wins is through to Saturday. Whoever loses is out. Gentlemen, good luck, have fun, shake hands. It's time to head to battle. Let's head back to Marshall and David for the match commentary. Thank you, Day9. And uh, as the players get seated and ready, of course, this is our chance, David, to take a look at the matchup in the deck list and have you use your expertise to explain how things are gonna go in your opinion and how the matchups end up playing out. Let's start with John Wolf. He's playing Gruul Warriors as his deck A. Primarily a red deck, you see signature cards like Goblin Chain Whirler, which is very intense on your mana, but also quite a bit of green here as well. Yeah, we watched uh, John Wolf earlier play this deck against Gabriel Nassif's Esper Control. Yeah. Uh, he didn't draw lands, so we didn't get to see a really competitive match, but I actually don't think that matchup is that great. Gruul Spellbreaker, giving, you, giving uh, Hexproof, has Hexproof on the controller's turn, is a big deal because it makes your opponent play in their main phase, but I still think that's not that great of a matchup. I think he'd rather see the Mono White Aggro with that deck. Now he's got a sideboard, he does have Dire Fleet Daredevil, so in case he Dire Fleet Daredevils a um, Mastermind's Acquisition, he wants to have a sideboard available, but I don't think it's likely to come into play. I mean, that's such a corner case, but you might want to have, you, you do want to have one just in case that comes up. Yeah, it's a why not type scenario. On the other side of the spectrum, though, is Esper Control, a much different build than we see from his uh, his deck A. This is deck B for him. Uh, anything stand out? This looks like a pretty standard issue build. It's pretty standard issue build, and, and uh, luckily for him, he's not up against Esper Acuity or Team of Reclam Reclamation like Gabriel Nassif had. Uh, he's up against Esper Control or Mono White Aggro, two decks. I'm sure he's practiced the matchup, and he feels confident in his ability to play against both of them. So uh, He does have one Mastermind's Acquisition in the main deck here, and that means that he'll have potentially access to any one of these cards out of the board, and boy, he has uh, everything covered here, I think. Yeah, the thing that you don't see out of him is the Mirari Conjecture, which is, uh, allows you to turn that one Mastermind's Acquisition into many more, especially if you have a Blink. So by not having that, he only pretty much gets one shot at it. it Dude, like, patient rebuilding. Just the once, please. This is the matchup that you'd wanted in Esper Control, deck A first of each. So what do we see here? This looks very similar to the other build. Yeah, one Mastermind's Acquisition and everything. Yeah, everything in this deck looks pretty standard. It's very similar. I believe the Syncopates are, are the extra counter spells he has. I don't see them in John Rolfe's list. So having a couple, and the Negate main, but I believe John Rolfe has two Negates. So he has one extra counter spell, four Absorb for both players, so yeah. Looks like uh, it's just going to be not drawing the dead cards is the key. Yeah, that is something that we've seen quite a bit. Here's the sideboard for Savits. Similar setup here, just a, a lot of silver bullets against the different types of decks that you may face throughout the course of a tournament like this. Deck B, yeah, this low to the ground. Sideboard looks pretty much standard like most people. He does have the Mariah Conjecture, which allows you to get cute, bring back the Mastermind's Acquisition, cast it twice in Chapter 3. Always fun to see that. Who was that, Ken Yukihiro yesterday? Yukihiro was just going... I was like, come on, Ken, quit playing with your food. And here is Savitsa's mono white deck. Again, fairly standard, 19 planes, all the four of on the one drop creatures, the, the lords with Banalish Marshall, three unbreakable formations, and two Conclave Tribunals. I mean, this seems like this is the optimal build. build. This is what most players have kind of arrived at with their, their white decks. Taking a look at our head-to-head, -head. check out our players here. Started back in 2005 for John Wolf. And he's got 10 Mythic Championships under his belt. He's even top eighted. Yeah, only 1,168 arena games compared to Savitz. Savitz is a known online game player, has lots of experience there. I'm actually shocked to see 2,800. It feels kind of low to me for a player like Savitz. I'm very familiar with him. Started playing Magic quite some time ago, but no Mythic Championships. He's focused on other games until now. But uh, Arena has sort of brought him into the magic world. It's now his, his, his main thing, it seems like. So happy to see him here. Happy to see us bringing new players in. Yeah, and he's crushing it so far. This is a decider, as we mentioned before. That means, of course, that the winner of this match will advance out of this brutal pod C, excuse me, group C. 
and the uh, the loser. That's going to be it. Yeah, if you, if you look at the players that uh, that advanced already and the players playing for it, it looks like today is kind of a reversal of yesterday. And if we saw the big name pros kind of had a tough time, only two of them, or actually three of them, made it through of the uh, the MPL players. But here we've already got one MPL player, one Hall of Famer, and Nassif and Manfield. We've got two MPL players playing on the other side of the bracket with uh, Reed Duke and Mike Siggers. We've got John Rolfe, tough MPL player against Savitz here. So. Looks like the MPL came to play for, for Group C, which is not surprising. It's called the group of, de group of Death, you know, for a reason. Yeah. It right, looks like players are just about ready. We'll get a chance to look at their opening hands once they're into the client and ready to go. We do like to sync up all of our players in our feature here so that they're uh, lined up. By the way, Group D is starting to fill out the other seats as well. We kind of roll over one to the next. So we'll get a, a chance to zoom in on them, starting with next round even more so. Yeah, we saw uh, we, we saw an interesting match. What it was at Newmont against um, Adverse. Adver. Adver. Adver last round. That was that was unfortunate for your 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 we're buddy. From, we're from the same town back home in Washington, and Kenji and I have known each other for a long time. But uh, yeah, I got to say, Adverse kind of scary. Yeah. Just that full grind to get into the, the qualification and uh, really seems to know what he's doing. Yeah, Kenji's got to gotta make the try to 4 -0 gambit. I, I misspoke earlier. I said Reed was trying to be the first to do it. I guess it sounds like Amy, Amazonian, and um, Quicksort seems like did it also, if, if uh, the chat I'm reading is correct, which is well, no you're, easy you, feat. You're trusting the chat. You know, I, I trust this my chat. This chat right here, I the trust, one. I trust my Twitch chat. All right, I, dude. I think they know. You'll learn. When it comes to facts like that, they, they like to fact correct. I, they're, they're, group, they're grouping up in the corner right now trying to get you with some very plausible information that's totally untrue. Yeah. And get well, you I'm to done trusting them after. I just gave them one shot. Okay. Fool me once. You know, ah, they're you know probably the right. I mean, You know the rest. Yeah, look at that. Chat right away says, wow, big mistake. <laughs> there's, there's your trusted chat. Yeah. Oh, same. man. Yeah. Trusting Twitch chat not like this has now been... <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't I don't stream often, so I'm not familiar. I just hang out there sometimes. Oh, we I, love I, chat. I just believe what I see. Don't, don't get me wrong. We love chat. It's just you don't go to them for factual information. <laughs> you know, you got to You got everybody's got to have their lane, right? I just loaded the bracket. Oh, man, take a look at the, the floor here. You can see a bunch of people standing out in front of us and watching Hi, everybody. And uh, as the players get ready behind us uh, in the feature match area, quite a setup we have. We've got these, uh, you may have seen them when we introduced the player, these like flaming spark machines. I've been told that you can, that they're not hot. Like you can like touch that and it, it's, it's cold, it doesn't hurt you. You hear that from Twitch chat? <laughs> Twitch chat, uh, don't, don't worry, the fire is fine. Go Just for it. Stick your hand in there. Sounds, yeah, yeah. Chat would not lie to me, I'll tell you yeah. that. Go ahead, Twitch chat, tell him. <laughs> stick his hand in the cold spark. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, they're all agreeing with you. Yeah, it's true. The they want to see it. Put the yeah. camera on them. All right, we've got right. opening hands here. Let's take a look at what John Rolfe is working with in his uh, Gruel deck. Because it looks like what he's drawn. Remember, it's random for game number one here, which deck you get. So is this a keeper? It looks like it. So we've got the Gruel Warriors deck on the draw. Um, yeah, I mean, like I say, it's got land. It's got spells. You can cast your Gruel Spellbreaker on three if you want to get your Darkfleet Daredevil, which I think you do. I mean... It's, it's hard to get value out of it in this matchup. I think the value is kind of just like a bonus. If you draw it late, get some value. If not, just go ahead and cast it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a keeper. You've got two drop, three drops, some burn spells to kind of finish off your opponent. At this point, also, we have to remember that Rolf doesn't know what his opponent's up against. And as we get a little reveal there for Savit, it is his mono white build. Yeah, and that now it makes that draw even better. A shock and lightning strike are two cards you want to have here. Shock can take care of the Aspirant lightning strike for Banalish Marshall or another small creature. So looks like Rolf's got a, a very good hand for this matchup. He is on the draw. And uh, you know, as we saw, this white deck can be pretty explosive and the creatures can get large pretty fast. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that hand looks a lot better against this opener than it would against an Esper deck with yeah. those two cheap burn spells not really doing a whole lot for a while. So yeah, that's and this, pretty fortunate for John, although he is slow. on the draw. This yeah. draw's pretty slow. You play a plethora of one drop so that ideally you can play one on turn one and two on turn two and really get the pressure started. Unless he draws one in his uh, first draw phase or second, you know, he doesn't have much speed here. No. It's 2-1 into 3-drop, which with Shock and, and Lightning Strike, he's not really going to have much going. No. But he's going to keep this hand. You can see he had his mouse hovered over the keep, and yeah. that's not one you can really send nah. back. But 
It's not, it's not an all-timer, that's for sure. All right, looks like we're just about underway in our decider here out of Group C. We've got four different players playing. These are two of them right here. And uh, again, everything on the line, you're gonna de definitely get a sense for the intensity that these players are feeling right now because this is what it all comes down to. You know, when you have one loss to give, it's like, well, you know, you lose one sometimes, I'll come back, I'll keep fighting. This is it. This is it, win or go home. And Darfleet Daredevil, I'll get back to it. Like, there's not really any spells. I guess an unbreakable formation, but that, you know, that's a, a pipe dream. But just being a 2-1 first strike is really big against these white decks. It's uh, not a lot of creatures have three toughness. It's hard to get by. It, it can hold off some guys. So looks like John Rolfe's got a pretty nice hand, even though he's on the draw, lined up against the draw of Sadiq's. Savic says, come on, I'm ready to put this aspirant onto the battlefield, start turning this thing sideways, see if it can go the distance. Yeah, Again, we're just, uh, we're just getting everybody else uh, playing this round lined up so that we can make sure that the round timer is correct for everybody. Well, we do have a 45 minute round timer. And that's particularly important because this matchup means next matchup, next game, game two, Esper Control Mirror. Hey, look at all the Magic fans out there. As for control mirror, could take yeah, a while. Yeah, wave with the camera, come on. There we go, everybody can now get a little, little camera time. Yeah, so with the Esper control mirror for game two, you know, if this game takes a little while, that game takes a while, we could come down to uh, a really long match three, although I don't think the players would, I don't think we're gonna end up in Esper control mirror for game three if we get there. Yeah, that's something that, uh, kind of interesting for this particular format, given the, the nature of the ability to actually go to time where Normally, Arena has a lot of safeguards where, you know, you, you rope, as we call it, you'll run out of time at some point. Yeah, anxiety rope is what I call it. <laughs> I don't like that thing. How about when it starts getting kind of red and you hear the dun-dun? Well, you don't really know, and it's, I like dun, it because it's kind of a mystery. Like, there's not actually a number ticking down. So, like, how much time do you, I don't, it, it doesn't matter, buddy. Make a play. That's yeah. what the system wants to tell you. Yeah. If, it, if it counted down, you would know, I'm just going to wait till one and make my, nope. Yeah, th that's the version for, for you know, uh, tabletop magic players. That's the, I need you to make a play. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the voice coming from over your shoulder, I need you to make a play. Oh, no, I, I got to do something. <laughs> and again, we're looking at the opening hands here, and uh, John says, I'm good to go. And Both they are good to go, keep. and we are underway here. So we're going to kick things off with turn one Sky Marcher Aspirin here from Savic. And he says, that's all I got, your move. This next draw step, by the way, from Savitz is going to be very important. If he can find a one or a two drop, that could really turbocharge this draw. If he doesn't, now it's going to be really slow for him. I think we're going to go ahead and see this Aspirant shocked here. Yeah, it looks like it's unbreakable formation is the draw step here. Honestly, not really what he wants to see at this point. He's going to have both of his creatures killed. He's going to be left with the venerated Loxodon, and that formation is going to sit in his hand. Now, if this game goes on for a while, that could be really good, but not with the configuration he has currently. Yeah, I think you're going to likely see a Dire Fleet Daredevil here uh, get on the board. He could hold up Lightning Strike so that end of turn he could Lightning Strike any potential Banalish Marshals and then untap and play a Ghoul Spellbreaker on three. But uh, knowing that there's not any value to get out of the, the Dire Fleet Daredevil really against the white deck, but, yeah, he's just going to go ahead and play it. Wow, another venerated Loxodon is the draw step. So Savic's hopes and dreams lay with this Banalish Marshal, and it is going to get snapped off by a Lightning Strike here, get in for two damage. Yeah, I mean, he's... And he's, he's kind of out of gas at this point. Yeah, he's going to go ahead and do it. I was going to say, he did have a choice. He could have played Gruel Spellbreaker, which would have actually set him up to be in a bad position if Savic drew a land, played a Loxodon to pump it up. But Ooh, hello. This changes things quickly. Yeah, another Banalish Marshal off the top of the library kind of puts the ball back into John Rolfe's court and says, do you have another answer? Because if he gets to untap, find that land, all of a sudden we're going to see Venerated Loxodon hit the battlefield. Ooh, nice bluff. Oh, this is a sick I bluff here it. from John Rolfe. Sends in his Instant. first striker Sends and says, Savit, welcome to high-level magic. You're not going to block this. You don't see that very often, but when you do, it's, it's pretty cool to think about. And, and you notice how Savit didn't even pause. He just instantly did not block. He just doesn't yeah. want to risk it. You know who else didn't pause? John. He's like, go to combat, draw, attack. Attack, yeah. yeah. Legion's landing was the draw step here for Savic. Not perfect, but it'll do. So what he was representing here is he was representing shock because yeah. if he had lightning strike, he would already cast it. So now I think you're likely going to see uh, Sidney's also play around a shot. Wow, that's a lot of extra value for John Rolfe. Well played by him. But Conclave Tribunal does hit the battlefield, taking yeah. out the uh, Gruel Spellbreaker. 
Yeah, although this is this hand without the removal is playing well for Sadiq. I mean, if he's able to live through these next two turns, he's going to get these Loxodons out. His creatures are going to get pretty large, and then he can follow it up with Unbreakable Formation and have an amazing attack. I think you're going to see Spellbreaker into Thorn Lieutenant, attack for two down to 14. And then here comes Venerated Loxodon pumping both those creatures up to a 4-4 four, four, and a 3-3. Three, three. The Loxodon itself will be a 5-5, five, five, which no. is bigger than anything on the board. We said it. We said, look, if this game goes on for a while, these are his most powerful options, right? And that's exactly what's happened. So Venerated Loxodon can come down as a 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, he's under some pressure. He's down to 11, but somehow this mono white deck just has the ability to go bigger than the green red deck. What kind of a world are we living in here, David? Yeah, I mean, we've seen this happen time and time again. I, I, mean, I think, you know, this might be one of the better creature matchups against the white deck, but the white deck frequently just make its creatures larger. It's insane. I mean, right now, John had, can consider just alpha striking, which is sending everything. Um, if he has a six land, which he does, the Thorn Lieutenant threatens to be bigger, right? Because it's plus four, plus four. That's correct. So he can send all three, or he could just send the Lieutenant and pump. But I think if you send all three, John, blo I mean, Savitz blocks a Spellbreaker. You do four, put him to seven, play another Dire Fleet Daredevil. Um, yeah, it's tough. I think maybe you just send the Lieutenant here. He doesn't want to throw away the Spellbreaker for two damage here, it looks like. Oh, no, no, no. He's thinking. Yeah, the, it, it's tough because the problem is, is like if your opponent flips that Legion's Landing, then he's going to have blockers for your Lieutenant. So it's just going to be the Thorn Lieutenant, and now he has to decide, do I want to take three, two damage or add on an extra four? Wow. He says, I'll take the four, put you down to five. Look how this is Last playing out. in there. It's, it's possibly Savitz might Unbreakable Formation this turn. If he does, Dire Fleet Daredevil can uh, cast that Unbreakable Formation. <laughs> oh, and he even has enough mana to do it. Right, and then his creatures Whoa. become amazing. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. He's doing it. This is Unbreakable Formation. He's hovering over. Will Savitz go he, for it and open this door? He is. And he doesn't have lethal. I mean, his creatures are bigger. But but John can just take this, John right? John can take this. But unfortunately for John, though, even if he flashes back the Unbreakable Formation, Savitz's creatures are still bigger. Yeah. Like right now, look at, Savitz's, look at John's creatures. Put a counter on them. They're still not bigger than a 6-6, six, six, a 5-5, five, five, and a 4-4. Four, four. Bang, bang, bang. Down to 5. 15 damage from Savitz. And this is going to open the door for him to dire f for John to dire fleet Dev daredevil, but oh wow though he's going to tap. He's going to play this Loxodon. Okay, wait, does this open the door for a win? He's going to have one blocker back, uh, which will be a five-five. It can block the spellbreaker, and he's going to have six, only six damage coming through. But he will be able to put his opponent into lightning strike range. Although the lifelink creature the following turn will take him right back out of lifelink range, and he'll have lethal. Well, they'll be un untapped. Yeah, this is, uh, it's cute, but I don't think it's going to be enough. So close here for John Rolfe, but it is Savitz who is ahead and looks to stay that way from okay. this perspective. So he chose not to tap the other locks it on and leave himself two blockers, which is pretty smart. It's Goblin Chain Whirler off the top of the library. And <laughs> remember when we said that was good against Mono White? Hmm, six, 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 five, 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 five. I see why we don't call it White Weenie anymore. It's just Mono wow. White Aggro because these are not weenies. Look at these guys. These guys are enormous. I mean, Green Red is supposed to be able to put out the biggest creatures, right? That's kind of the name of the game for that color pair. And it is just getting soundly trounced by Mono White in the creature department here. I think I might have uh, tapped the Loxodon and left the, no, because then it would just be a 4-4 lifelinker. Yeah, he could have left the lifelinker up also instead of the, the Loxodon. Which he thought about it. He did. And I think he decided there's just no way this guy's killing me next turn and I'd rather have a bigger lifelinker to crack back with or block with going forward. So here it is, Unbreakable Formation exiled from the Dire Fleet Daredevil, and he gets to cast it now, but it somehow just doesn't look like it's gonna be enough. Yeah, he could send all his creatures, which he does, but he's only gonna get through for three damage here. So I think he's gonna like, I mean, it's, they're, they're, it's three damage, they're indestructible, so there's no reason not to. Yeah. But yeah. if he had left a lifelinker back, then it actually wouldn't even net any life, because he could just put the 4-4 lifelinker on the 3-2 Dire Fleet Daredevil. Mm -hmm. As it stands, Savich is just gonna soak up as much damage as he can. In this case, that's gonna be seven. Creatures are indestructible, so it's just basically uh, put a counter on your guys and your opponent takes three. Yeah. I suppose he's still considering the possibility of shock going back multiple turns and just figuring, well, is there one I want to lose? He had the 6-6 six, six on the 4-4, four, four, but right. figured if he had the shock, that would lose my 6-6 six, six, and I'd rather keep that. But that's not, in fact, what John has. That was a bluff going back multiple turns. And once again, you see 5, 10, 15, 22 This is an alpha strike power. here because all four of your creatures are lethal. Your opponent's at five. 
Uh, I guess he is worried about maybe a block shock and then a, a kind of attack and then drawing a lightning strike maybe, but like he could chump block everything, uh, put the 5-5 five, five on a 3-2, cast shock, which would first strike plus shock, kill the lifelinker, lose three creatures, have a 3-2 back. But even so, you have a dodge till the first four. It gets, yeah, you're right, but it gets super interesting because of that play earlier where shock is the card that Savic is supposed to think that John Wolf has here. Yeah, but I think he may have realized that there's yeah, no shock. No the, way, way. the way the game's played out, there's no shock. So I think we're going to see all creatures get blocked. Oh, this is an interesting play. First strike and take down the Banalish Marshal, which oh. would leave the 5-5 five five that's unblocked only does four. Really heads oh. up play by John Rolf here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. John Rolf, what do we have here? Remember, Banalish Marshal is responsible for plus one, plus one on every other creature, but thanks to First Strike killing it right now, it will go away, and he's only getting in for four. Is there an opening here for John Rolf to win this game still? Likely not. The, the lifelink from that four put him at 10, mm -hmm. and he's got an untapped to dodge with the first for it. And because it's untapped, Chain Whirler can't get it because he can make it in combat. So it's going to be pretty hard to do four more damage with these Direfleet Daredevils. And being at one, he's going to need four blockers to deal with. Well, actually, he can play the Chain Whirler, which would kill the token, so now he's got enough blockers, but he doesn't have an attack. That is a lot of first strike he's got available, though. This gets kind of interesting. Yeah. If he attacks with all three, he forces, I mean, again, one unknown card in hand for John. If, if Savic could see his I'm hand, he would know. Mouth. Yeah, if he attacks with all three, he has to line up one creature on each attacker. Right. Two of them get eaten, one of them eats the token, and then you end up with two Loxodons against a Goblin Chain Whirler. But is there risk there from Savic's side not knowing what that last card is in hand for I don't John? think so, because you can make a 1-1 one, one Lifelinker in combat. Ooh, he chose not to attack. Yeah, I but think. I mean, that makes sense. If he attacks with all three and he loses, you know, he can just have one of his creatures eat and chump block the other one, burn the other one. Yeah, but it's pretty obvious he doesn't have a burn spell the way this game played out and the last combat went. Well, so would you trading, risk it? It's not really a, I think it's not really a risk. You're trading your token for two of his creatures. Well, if he had yeah, a burn spell, go. though, he could double block two first strikers on the 5-5 five, five or whatever, right? I mean, that thing I just think you can he didn't have a burn spell with the way the game played. Safely, it's almost yeah, well, Would you impossible. put your tournament on it? I think so. Okay. I because believe if, you, by If the not, way. you allow this to happen. Like, he draws more creatures. Yeah, you seriously. You give him time to draw more threats. There's a downside to not making that line of play. Absolutely. And, and now there's the this. lightning strike. John Rolf is at one life By here. not going for it, if, had he gone for it the previous turn, just now would have been a, a profitable attack to win the game. Now, by not going for it, the lightning strike was finally drawn, which is really going to make combat difficult for him. All the first strike on the other side of the battlefield for John Rolf is really kind of wrecking the attack step here for Savitz. He's still dangerously close to winning. Remember, John's only at one, he's ahead on creatures, and he's making an additional creatures every turn, regardless of his draw step. Now, if he makes a token, he's going to have six attackers with four blockers and one card in hand. Two are going to get through. One gets lightning strike if he has a burn spell, so he is going to die. Yeah. So that should be enough. Six attackers, four blockers, one removal spell means one gets through. And because there's only one card in hand, you know it's not something that can kill two creatures. So I think he's thinking here he just wants to not misstep and not make a creature. He has to make sure he remembers to make a 1-1 one, one lifelinking vampire token, and that should be it. Perhaps a desperation attack here from John Rolfe, seeing the writing on the wall. Yeah, he's thinking about it, but I, I think he sees if there's no drawback to blocking the Loxodons on the three twos. I mean, your opponent's going to do that. He's, I mean, he's hoping maybe his opponent just takes it and he can lightning strike for the win because right. he knows he's dead otherwise because I think he can be pretty sure Savitz is not going to forget to make a token. So if you know you're dead otherwise, you might as well. This is the, the Hail Mary play. Just send yeah. him and see what happens. And that's what he's got to do because the Rekindling Phoenix has a clean line of attack here. He just needs one of the other creatures to get through and then he would win off of that lightning strike, but Savitz is having none of it. He's going to put up blockers on everything here. Yeah, knowing your, your opponent's deck list with one card in hand, you can pretty much deduce what the worst thing that could happen is. And just looking at it, you know, Collision Colossus could give Trample, so you got to worry about that. Oh, but that's a great point. That's an interesting one, four, too. And if you had Collision Colossus on one of the Daredevils at seven, that's enough, right? Seven minus one, first strike. You take six and then four in the air. So he may want to rethink his blocks here. 
Yeah, I think that's why he, he kind of moved around. But I don't think there's actually a block that gets through that unless yeah. you put all three of your 1-1s one on the Dire Fleet there, Fellow. But even then, it's going to be uh, 7 minus 3 is 4. You're, yeah, you're taking 8. So that actually would have been the block that did it. But it didn't work for uh, John Wolf. He is attacking in to knock him down to 5, but he's losing the majority of his board, or half of it, I should say. And this is going to line up a beautiful attack here for Savits to take down game number 1. Wolf yeah. made it interesting. The Dire Fleet Daredevil, uh, Daredevil play was pretty cool. But here, I will say this. We uh, are done. Even though John Wolf lost this game, I'm very impressed with this play, and I see why he's in the MPL. He, he played this game very well, considering what he had. Yeah, he's really smart. He, had, he gave himself the best chance to win. Had he drawn Collision Colossus there in that last turn, I think he would have actually pulled that game out. Yep, he gave himself outs to win, but it was not to be. That was Savits taking down game number one and putting himself just one game away from advancing out of Group C. What are we looking at for the, the matchup? Remember, the players are going to play the decks that they didn't play in this first game, and uh, we're going to switch the play draw regardless. Um, so that would be Esper Control for John Rolf and Esper Control for Savits. Yeah, it looks like Savits is actually better prepared for the mirror. He has two copies of Kaya. Uh, one negate, two syncopates, whereas John Rolf doesn't have any, he has one Kaya, two negates, and zero syncopates. So one extra threat and one extra counter spell, which I'm assuming they have close 26 land or 24 land, so they probably, somewhere between there, which means he has less dead cards. He has more cards that are relevant in this match, you know, less things like Moment of Craving. So let's see, they both have Moment of Cravings, no Cry the Carnariums for, for Savits. Excellent hand for Savits. Three lands. He's going to want some more lands. Two to berries, a syncopate, and a search for his Kanta. Wow, and a thought erasure as well to help clear the way a little bit, a little bit down the line for one of those to berries. Things looking beautiful here. An equally for uh, impressive hand for John Rolf. Uh, no dead cards. Absorb and thought erasure are both very important. Kaya and a to berry. This thought erasure can help ensure that your Kaya gets through next turn. So, thought I raised your turn two here from John. Tough choice here, what to take. I mean, search for his Kanta is one of the key cards in a control mirror, and he doesn't have a Mortify in hand or a way to get rid of it. So I think we're going to see that, which we do. But then now he knows he's going to get thought erasure right back. Probably take away that Kaya. Leave himself, leave him on a five drop and an absorb. An absorb is not a proactive card, so he has no worries there. So I think we're going to see Kaya taken. in the tank. I don't think you want to leave Akaya because even though it's a little slow, it's still going to gradually gain an advantage. Uh, exiling cards from the yard, I mean, if you do get another search for Escanta, it won't really be able to flip. Uh, eventually, you'll have to deal with it. If not, that ultimate ability can, can really cause some problems for you in the late game. He, he could take the Teferi, leave him with no threats, or even the Absorb to kind of ensure that he can resolve a Teferi of his own, assuming uh, Rolf doesn't draw any counter spells in the next few turns. Really tough choice here. Yeah, Kaya's the most immediate threat, but she doesn't I like necessarily the Kaya. win the game. I like the Kaya because you just keep your opponent, you know, not doing anything right now. You know, he went for the Absorb saying, you know what, I'm just going to cast my uh, Teferi in a couple of turns and get rid of Kaya anyway, but boom, negate right off the top yeah, of the library there from spell John. Right back that... Hello, friend. And, of course, he does get to resolve Kaya Orzhov Usurper and see if she can uh, take over the game going forward. Again, from the immediacy standpoint, not super insane, but... Uh, but she is a problem going down the line. Beautiful. The surveil uh, allowed him to put a thought erasure right back on top so he can go in and get either that Teferi or the negate. Um, you know, we could see him take the Teferi here because he's got two threats that need to be negated. But his opponent doesn't have a fifth land, so he goes in and took the negate because if his opponent resolves the Teferi, he can just play his own Teferi and tuck John Rolf's Teferi. He's going to go ahead and put a, an Absorb in the graveyard because he doesn't have his fifth mana. He's got two mana and play, two in hand. I think he wants to make sure he hits his land drops. He decided he's going to be playing kind of tap out blue, it feels like, you know, once he gets to five mana. So holding up for Absorb is not where he wants to be right now, especially after he knows his opponent's hand. He's going to have Syncopate if John Rolf decides to tap out for his Teferi on turn five. Even though, although John Rolf knows that, and if he plays his land next turn, John Rolf does know all of his hand except his draw phase. 
Another land off the top of the library there for Ceviche. He's going to play this land tapped and pass the turn back. The syncopate looks a lot worse when your opponent knows about it. They can play around it at their leisure. See, he did not walk into the syncopate yet. I mean, at some point, you're going to have to get that syncopate out of your opponent's hand. But I don't think he wants to put his last business card and then be left with nothing. Now, Savitz knows his opponent only has Teferi and Swamp. Excuse me, not Swamp, just Teferi and Random Card. He can play his own Teferi here. It's going to untap two lands, which will allow him a syncopate for one. But John Rolfe will be able to play a land and cover that syncopate for one. So he can play his own Teferi and tuck Savitz's Teferi, Teferi. Wow. The gate's a good draw, but he doesn't have enough mana. If he decides to tuck, it won't untap two lands, and he won't be able to cast in the gate. But if he does play his Teferi, he has to tuck Savitz's Teferi, or Savitz can just do it right to him. It's kind of a forced play here when you're playing Teferi against Teferi. Yeah, I think we're going to see minus three. Put Savitz's Teferi below, but I'm, he knows Savitz has another Teferi, so maybe that's why he's just going to draw a card. It doesn't oh. accomplish much if you know your opponent has one. It's just pretty unfortunate that uh, Savitz can just put John Rolfe's right back in his deck. Goes to his end step. Hmm, he exiled cards from his own graveyard. Hmm. And there goes the Teferi. Three cards from the top. We've got a Syncopate now online with six mana against just a negate and some lands. But luckily for John Rolfe, he has that negate, and it's going to line up. He'll have his seventh mana when he plays this to Ferry. So unless Savitz draws another counterspell, he'll be able to get it in the board. But unfortunately, Teferi will be back up to four, uh, four loyalty by then and be able to just tuck it one more time. Although with the Vraska's Contempt, he can actually just Vraska's Contempt it. He's going to go, go ahead and get the Kaya with the Vraska's Contempt, or at least attempt. He doesn't know any cards in John Rolfe's hand. Doesn't have enough mana to syncopate this negate, so the contempt will be negated. Love the art on the, the card style on the Vraska's Contempt. Ooh, so it cool. looks really nice how it's all blacked out, and then just the artwork is kind of super highlighted there in the middle. Looks fantastic. Love that. Also not a bad effect in the game of Magic the Gathering as we yeah. see it. Taking out a pretty strong pesky card. Pretty pretty yep. strong card. David, I got an update for you. Okay, let's hear it. Uh, Mike Sigrist and uh, Reed Duke were battling it out in the other decider. Reed Duke. Reed Duke. I haven't said what happened yet. Oh, okay. He won. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he, uh, he lost 0-2 the first time they played, and he came back and, and got it done. Huh? He did. He came all the way back, and he is going to advance through from Group C. Reed, one of the lucky to escape so far Seth Manfield, Yellow Hat, and Reed Duke. Good guy, Reed. And this uh, is going to decide the fourth and final person yeah. to emerge from the group. It's looking good death. for Savitz. He's got a Teferi unimpeded. He's got a handful of cards. Yeah, I kind of wanted to get that update in here because uh, <laughs> Savitz is starting to pull ahead pretty significantly here. And yep. now John Wolf has to decide if he wants to fire a negate off on Mastermind's acquisition. He says, yes, I do. Really impressive showing by Savitz. I've been impressed with this play here. I you know, agree. Coming from another game, not one of the known Magic pros, and he's been he's been hanging, hanging with them, playing well. Big fan. You're yeah. a big fan of his? Yeah, I'm a big fan of him. Big fan of the guy. Watched the stream before and stuff. Oh, absolutely. So we got to have Teferi here with how much mana left over? Three, four mana left over. But we know about a syncopate, so we're not going to cast it because we just get syncopated and have no cards in hand. So uh, John Rolfe's going to just hope to draw something. To to get I mean, in this, what can he even find at this point? Like this has gotten so out of hand. Look at the cards in hand. Yes, yeah, he needs it's one seven of the, to one. He needs like a main deck Nezahal like uh, Nasif has, but yeah. unfortunately he doesn't have that. There's uh, looking at his deck list here. I don't really see a way out of this. I mean, he would have to have a, just a string of good cards back to back to back. I mean, this is a start. He can absorb the syncopate, but unfortunately for him, Teferi in play he can just put his back, you know, back three cards down. And he's right back where he started. Two backup Teferis in hand for Savitz. Three. Well, excuse me, three Teferis in hand. He's got all four. 
You like? Uh, hey, hey, kid, I heard you like the fairies. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I got three extras. Give you a good deal. So, so a little bit of a counter fight here. Syncopate on your Teferi, absorb back as you described, David, and that does let so this is brutal. John Rolf finally resolve a Teferi, but it's Sigh of relief. John Rolf's gonna tuck his Teferi, I imagine. Nope, still not gonna do it. Just gonna draw a card, try to get back in it. And he doesn't know that there's a handful of Teferi, no. so he could tuck it, but Savit's although with the chemist's insight, Savit could just draw his draw phase and the chemist's insight, draw those two cards and get his Teferi back, replay it, tuck his, so that plan's not gonna get you anywhere anyways. He's just gonna hope. Yeah, he looks like he's going to minus Teferi on the other Teferi here straight away. But he's reconsidering it. Yeah, I think when you're in a commanding advantage like this, that's the only way your opponent can get out of it is by having their own Teferi go nuts. So go ahead and get his off the board. Oh, and he's going to play another one. Basically, he's paying five mana to put three loyalty on his Teferi. Because the Teferi he just uses down to two, and this allows him to put it back up to five and get a card. So he just paid five mana to put some loyalty on his Teferi. Real heads up play. Not a lot of players are kind of would waste it to ferry in that sense, you know, but just holding four of them total, three in your hand and one in play, you might as well. Yeah, it's, it's a resource you can afford. Moment of craving, stone blank. Get rid of that. Turn it into two more cards. Ooh, and there's a Kaya as well. Yeah, this one has really fallen away from John Wolf, and you can just see it. I mean, John Wolf's hand is effectively zero cards. Kaya's Wrath doesn't do anything in this matchup at all. And if you look down, sure, there's a few blanks in hand for Savich as well, but for the most part, he is the one who's got things rolling thanks to the two Planeswalkers on his side. And this is where things snowball. Like, it's not getting better from here. There's no big swinging play right now in Standard where John can be like, I drew exactly the thing I needed and I'm right back in this because he would need a card that killed both Planeswalkers and drew him like five cards and they don't print them like that. <laughs> yeah, Planeswalkers are hard to catch up. So yeah. if you like Planeswalkers, War of the Spark. There you one go. One in every pack. There you go. One in every pack. Yeah, and this this is just a part of the play style, the play nature of Planeswalkers and Standard is that they really do demand answers quickly. And in control matchups like this, Planeswalkers are designed so that you can attack them with creatures, and that doesn't happen here. So you need specific answers at specific times, and if you don't find them, they get completely out of hand, and Savic is no stranger to that right now as he's looking down, dominating the board with uh, Kaya and Teferi. Yeah, John trying to think, navigate his way out. I'm sure he's thinking of what sequence of cards he needs to draw to give him the best chance, as we saw he did that last game. So it's clear that he's a, a very thoughtful player. Trying to figure out a way to wiggle out of this. Not easy. And it ain't getting any better here either. So once again, the Teferis are fighting each other. By continually playing his Teferi and forcing Savitz to tuck it, though, he's keeping uh, Savitz's Teferi from getting the eight loyalty. Because once that emblem is there, there's no catching up. Right. There's a couple of different ways that this game could end. One of them is that, make a, an emblem eventually exile all of your lands, and then do the thing where you target Teferi with his minus three ability over and over again so that you don't get decked and your opponent does. Once you have no more cards in your library, if it's time for you to draw a card and you can't, you lose the game. That's just how it works in Magic. On the other side, there's also Kaya. She can do a lot of damage over the course of the game. Yeah, and it's adding up. Let's see, it's ticking up. Now, he finally drew an Absorb, so he can absorb um, Ro John Rolf's Teferi if he does play it, which will save him from having the minus three and tuck it, which will allow him to creep towards that eight loyalty needed for the ultimate. Ooh. And a search for his cant is just what he wants. Yeah, it's funny because uh, Mortify was kind of rotting away in John Rolf's hands. He's going to find a target for it, but I believe that Savic will fight over this. Maybe not. Uh, we'll find out. Because you, you do want to stop your opponent's Teferi so that you can eventually get your Teferi emblem. Yeah. I'm not uh, going to lie, though. I don't think it matters. You know what I mean? Like, if he decides to fight over this, if he doesn't. Yeah. He's just, just in such good shape here with this absurd hand. Yeah, he's going to go ahead and let it resolve. He's got six spells and a land in hand versus two blank spells from John Wolf, and still has the Planeswalker train rolling here as well. Here's the fairy we were waiting on, and the Absorb we held for it. Now... That was a key moment, by the way. Th th that was the turn right there where this game well and truly is done now. I, you know, Absolutely. John, John was still in there at least scrapping around well, with the Teferi, but this game's over. I mean, it's been over for a while, but that was a big turn to allow it to end faster. But can, I, can I call out the final nail in the coffin? Yes, but if he didn't draw the syncopate here, I mean, John Rolf still had outs. He could just draw a Teferi right here and tuck that Teferi, and we're right back where we were. 
But now right. we've got syncopate, so 4, 8, 12, 16 mana. We can do over 15. We've got plenty. And I say we as the player who uh, it's on right now. What's wrong with John Rolfe? Absolutely nothing. You know, because I was going to say, we're not doing too good here, David. <laughs> we're, we're, we are getting smacked around by two Planeswalkers. And this one's not going to end well. And here we go. Plus, 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 plus. And then eventually we will see an ultimate here. In fact, next turn. Thought erasure just to make sure there's nothing going on. But you can be pretty certain of it the way the games play that your opponent doesn't have anything. Yeah. He doesn't even want another thought erasure. <laughs> it's a good place to be. Exile the card you removed. So now we have two Planeswalkers on ultimate. Just a cool 18 loyalty here. I believe Kai is on double ultimate, right? It's minus five. You mm -hmm. can whack him twice. Thought Erasure going to see these fairies. And that is going to do it. Savich earns the victory and earns his way out of Group C. Wow, well earned by him, by the way. That was not easy. He had to work his way through some of the best players in the game's history. And he has done so. So Savich is going to be one of the only four players here out of Group C to actually make it through. He's going to join Reed Duke as well as Seth Manfield. And who was the last one? Gabriel Nassif. Gabriel Nassif, yellow hat two himself. Two MPL, two challengers, one of which has an asterisk because he's a Hall of Famer, one of the best. But yeah, yeah. still, pretty sweet to see uh, a nice mix coming through the group, not just all the big name MPL members. It shows that uh, yeah. you know, a lot of these players came to play. We have seen that pretty consistently over the course of the weekend as well. Challengers are here to battle, man. They are like not it. making it easy on the uh, the kind of the old guard, you know, the the staunch uh, players that we've had for so long here. I I'm rooting for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is sense. fun. I mean, who, who can resist an underdog story, right? It's Absolutely. Good, yeah. Uh, of course, that means that Group C is finished. That's it. We've got our four players. We took 16. We eliminated them down to four, and that leaves us just with this last Group D, which, again, it's already underway here, but now we're going to be focusing on Group D and seeing who's going to emerge from that. The four players that finish from that, that's going to be it. That's 16 players. That's your top 16 for the tournament. We went from 64 to 16 in just two short days. That's how it works in a bracketed double elimination tournament that we're running here at the Mythic Invitational. And uh, I don't know about short days. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. The players played. I bet you asked the I players, lied. was it short days? They're going to say no. I'm what, tired. what about us? We had to cover yeah. two pods. Uh, our job's easy. We get to watch good magic. <laughs> Way less taxing than playing those matches. Yeah, if you say so. I'd rather be, well, yeah, I'm not going to say what I'm doing on my laptop here, but I might be playing a match in between games or in between uh, rounds here. Thanks so much for joining us here for coverage of the Mythic Invitational, uh, powered by Omen by HP. I'm Marshall Psycho. That's David Williams. We've got a great coverage crew here to uh, to join uh, to bring you all the coverage and the action here from everything. Right now, though, one of them, Becca, is with our winner.